So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. I'm so pleased on today's show that we are going to focus on one of the people that has lit, lit up, if that's the correct way of pronouncing it. Um, the grammar is incorrect, maybe, because I've been talking to Tim Vickery too long and he's been in Brazil longer than he should have. But one of the people who's lit up the Premier League over the last few years has got to be the Egyptian wizard uh, from uh, Egypt via Chelsea and finally landed at Anfield. Do you know who I'm talking about, Tim? I do, yes. Um, I'd just like to comment on the fact that we've obviously been talking to Brian Clough because uh, both of us have turned up wearing a tie. There's yeah. a lovely story of the young, as, I think it was Guy Mowbray, as his, his first job as a cub reporter. He's got to go travel with Nottingham Forest down on the train, down down to that London. And he turns up all nicely dressed, but Clough has a look at him and says, uh, you're very welcome to travel with the delegation of Nottingham Forest. But, <laughs> but if you you're travelling with Nottingham Forest, we <laughs> do like you to wear a tie. Uh, and he, he just slapped money in the hands of guy and said, go and get a tie, otherwise otherwise you can't get on the train. <laughs> so uh, here we are, both in tyres. And to bring it back to Liverpool, you sit in there. Baby, you can drive my car. I will do, <laughs> because we've got one of the great football correspondents from Liverpool with us, Simon Hughes, who's just written a biography of the one and only Mo Salah. Simon, welcome to the Brazilian Journey podcast. Thanks very much. I've got to say, that Clough impression was outstanding, Tim. Yeah, he does. He's an impressionist. Wait, wait till you hear he's George Harrison. <laughs> he's got more where that came from. So well, that, that's an old, that's an old Liverpool accent that you see. It's more okay. easily. Yeah. It, yeah, it's not. It's not. No, no, no. It's old Liverpool, South Liverpool, where people speak through the noses a lot more rather than the throats. What happened? Why did they stop speaking like that? I thought it was the Beatles. That's a great question. That's a great question. I think everything evolves with time, doesn't it? And certainly, I think more people in Liverpool speak with a, I would say, a more, a more of a North Liverpool accent, which is a slightly more working class area of the city. Oh. Has Mo Salah picked up some of this? <laughs> because and one of the great things was hearing Jan Mulby speak... Uh, <laughs> I was saying the other day, I've been in in in, in uh, the away end with Liverpool fans. It's back in the 80s. And they were going, come on, Mulby lad. Yeah. And I love the idea of Mulby lad. And him speaking English, you could tell that he was that he, he had real roots in that community. When you hear Mo Salah speak English, is there any Scouse influence? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, the, the difference is Jan, Jan Mulby, he's lived on the Wirral, I think, for most of his time. Um at Liverpool, playing for Liverpool or being based in England. And, OK, the world's not quite Liverpool, but it's close enough. And he's been in the city of Liverpool often enough to pick up that accent. Um, and it is a remarkable accent. It is. I mean, it, Jan Malby is Scouse as far as I'm concerned, because I always think, you know, Liverpool is a place of immigration. It's not even whether you were born here. It, it is, it's more of a state of mind, really. And I'd say Jan Malby has that state of mind. But Mohamed Salah has lived his whole time uh, while playing for Liverpool in Cheshire, as a lot of the players do now, uh, right. including some of the Merseyside, you know, born players. So, yeah, I mean, his, his connection with the city maybe isn't quite as deep-rooted as Jan Malby's, but he, he's not alone in that sense. You know, I think players tend to commute a lot more than they, they used to when they were based in, in places like the Wirral or Southport or, or more recently, even even Formby. But he is definitely one of you, isn't he? He has become one of you. Yes. Do you remember yeah. him arriving relatively unheralded? Yeah, that, that, that was the thing. When, when Liverpool signed him in 2017, he was a record buy, but there was no sense of excitement, none at all. Um there was a little bit of scepticism, obviously, because he, he he didn't do so well at Chelsea. But Liverpool fans, the ones that I was speaking to, you know, friends at the time, it wasn't like, oh, we sound a, a Chelsea reject. Uh, they'd seen, you know, that he'd sort of relaunched his career and was doing well. And they knew about his pace as well, which is always an asset in a, in a team if it can be utilised. But there just wasn't that much excitement. There was more excitement the year before when they signed Sadio Mane. I think it was because they'd seen exactly what he could do on a football pitch because he'd done so well against Liverpool. Um, but very, very quickly after Salah arrived, I mean, there's, there's a before Salah and an after Salah, I think, <coughs> Liverpool and the rise under Jurgen Klopp. 
before they looked like a team that had potential, but he, I think, made everybody think that the impossible was possible because of the just sheer number of goals that he scored. And not only that, the area, the pitch that he played, you know, it was like this guy was on the wing scoring Ronaldo, Messi number of goals. So, you know, over very quickly, Liverpool fans started to believe, you know, that this guy was incredible and that the team could actually, you know, challenge whether that be in the Premier League or, or the Champions League. How much of this is a Jurgen Klopp story? Well, it is, but maybe not quite as people think, really. I mean, when, when Liverpool signs Mohamed Salah, Jurgen Klopp had other priorities. There were other players that he was interested in. The Julian Brandt story is, is well known. You know, that he, um, he'd obviously had a, a good understanding of the German market and he felt that Julian Brandt was a player that was capable of developing at Liverpool. But Julian Brandt was a year out of the World Cup with Germany and didn't fancy the move, really. He, he was worried about moving to a new country ahead of the World Cup and adjusting and how that might affect his chances getting into the squad. But Liverpool had watched Mohamed Salah for a long period of time, going back to before he signed for Chelsea. Liverpool were, thought they were in pole position to sign him. Um, I'd spoken to him face-to-face -face where, you know, he accepted really that, that he would get a chance at Liverpool and it'd be a lot harder potentially at other clubs, including Chelsea. But I think it was the Mourinho factor, really, you know, when it came to it, when when Mourinho picked up the phone and said, I want you to sign for me. It's very difficult for a player to say no. Let's not forget, you know, Mourinho had, was still regarded as one of the great football managers at that time. Um, and, and not only that, Chelsea paid more money than Liverpool were, were capable of paying. So he went there. Um, and the interesting thing is, I mean, I think in the rise under Jurgen Klopp, a lot of people... You know, everybody can see what Jurgen Klopp is like. You know, he's very loud and and sort of uh, sort of avuncular with the players. But his relationship with Salah was 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 just professional, really, over a long period of time. Like Salah came into the team and started scoring goals straight away. And because of the the roots of his story going back to Egypt, he's never felt like he needed that sort of paternal character to to help him through moments and he didn't have any difficult moments the early stage of Liverpool came in scored straight away and he could arguably say well you know I transformed this team as well you know so I think that the best way of putting it is I think the best instincts of Jurgen Klopp never really combined with what Mohamed Salah needed as a footballer you know it wasn't like Klopp sort of persevered with him over a long period of time or any period of time really it was just more came in scored goals and ultimately it was the scouts state people like Dave Fallows who really pushed this signing and went to extreme lengths to make sure that Liverpool got him so there was never that really that relationship which might surprise people because I think when you, you see the way football is now if you see success you, you people automatically sort of assume that everybody loves each other behind the scenes when mm. particularly when you've got an in-house club media channel which is pumping out all these happy pictures of the players hugging each other the manager hugging the players but the reality is a bit more nuanced than that um not that they were each other's throats but they were just there wasn't that relationship you know the wasn't wasn't as close as he was with other players anyway what about the front three as <laughs> an idea yeah well I, I think that is where you can definitely say you know Jurgen Klopp had a massive role in Salah's well, yields and performances in the sense that a lot of it comes down to Roberto Firmino. You know, I'm, as, a, as, a, as a man of Brazil, I probably don't need to explain why, but he he um, he arrived at Liverpool in the summer of 2015 and nobody could quite figure out what his best position was, really. Um, Brendan Rodgers certainly didn't really want him in the team. He wasn't a first pick under Brendan Rodgers, Klopp's predecessor, but Klopp straight away, immediately, as soon as he came in, is you are going to be the centre forward, but not a centre forward in the traditional sense. It was a centre forward who would drop into spaces, bringing the defenders out into positions that he didn't want to be in, allowing him to express himself, use his skill. I mean, he's he's got to be one of the most simultaneously skillful and hardworking players that I've ever seen play football. You, very difficult player to define in, in many ways. Didn't score a huge number of goals. Could score goals. So would score goals in inventive ways that people, ordinary footballers, wouldn't imagine. But because of that movement, it allowed Salah the space to drive into and Mane on the other side, who slightly different player to, to, to Salah, but 
with the pace and the aggression that they both had, um, combined with the guile and the 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 vision and the work rate that Firmino had, it was just an unstoppable force. I mean, it, you just knew going to games throughout that period. You know, Liverpool were going to score goals. It was uh, breathtaking to watch at times. You've the the game that you've chosen to to look at is uh, second leg of the Champions League quarterfinals on um, April the 10th, 2018. But we're right now in the middle of the Klopp versus Guardiola epic battles. And I remember the meeting at the start of the year mm. at Anfield um, where it was it ended up 4-3 to Liverpool, but Liverpool were 4-1 up. And it was it was a beautiful expression of 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 the heavy metal, wasn't it? The yeah. relentless steamroller, high press, where they, with the pressing and so on, they managed to separate Fernandinho from the rest of the Man City team, and they yeah. won the ball in there and and just absolutely ran riot. That I think was a very significant moment. It's the, it's the real moment when the Klopp Liverpool announced themselves as a as 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 a real threat. Was that felt in Liverpool um, um, in the same way? Yes, yes, it was. It, that that felt like an arrival moment, really, for Liverpool. That this team was a team that you could trust, because it it goes back even further than that team. Earlier on in the season, Liverpool went to went to Manchester City and lost five nil. Now, Sadio Mane got sent off very early on in the game, so there's that context. But when you lose 5 0 to a team that you're hoping to push a bit further, you know, it's quite demoralising. And then it, it does get forgotten that in the first half of that season, you know, Liverpool were shipping goals, a lot of goals, and drawing games and in some cases losing games from positions that they should have been winning them. Especially um, against weaker sides, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was games. I mean, I remember the Seville away in Seville. They were three 0 up and and three all. I mean, it was a really. It was beginning to people were beginning to ask, can you really trust this team? But, but what what changed it also? Obviously, was Virgil Van Dijk signing. I mean, it was night night and day. You know, in the course of that season, suddenly Liverpool had somebody at the back who everybody just believed in. You know, he had this calm way about him. Calm but dominant. He he was magnificent, a magnificent impact on the season. But you bring it back to that that other game that you mentioned, the four three. That was obviously the first time they played City since the five nil, and they absolutely tore into them. You know, very quickly built up that lead. Um, I'm trying to think. Did Virgil Van Dijk actually play in that game? I know he missed one of the games, but it, it was a real confidence booster for Liverpool. You know, City came back into the game. And threatened to, to maybe claw it back. You know, it, it gave certainly Anfield that belief that when City were going to come to Liverpool, that they could really trouble them because City under Guardiola, certainly that season, hadn't been bothered that much. You know, they, they, they'd had it pretty much their own way all the way through. You're quite right. He didn't, he didn't play in the full Don't three. Think, yeah, yeah. I thought, it was uh, thought, Lovren and, and, and Matip at the, the heart so, of the defence. So, so he, he comes in, has an impact, and then... Obviously, they go back to Lovren and Matip, who together, with, alongside Van Dijk, could play. But together, not so convincing. But Liverpool get the results. And then they go into the Champions League game, which, let's not forget, City were, were coasting in the league that season. And I, I just remember ahead of that game, there was just such an enormous sense of anticipation, which hadn't really been... It, it felt a lot like the, the games between Liverpool and Chelsea under Benitez and Mourinho 10 years earlier when there was just this sense that something was going to happen that night. I remember, you know, the atmosphere outside the ground was was very... Um, I'm trying to think of the right word, to be honest, because obviously the Manchester City bus was, was pelted with, you know, cans and bottles and one of the windows shattered. And that was, you know, a consequence maybe of, of, of the... City made a lot of noise ahead of the game about, you know, the the the, the bus journey to the ground because they'd encountered a few problems before. And I think a few, I mean, it, it, you, you can't be um, definitive about it, but it felt like there were a lot of people around the ground who were, were just there to see this moment, you know, to give them a bit of, you know, give them some stick and it spills into 
scenes that you prefer didn't happen. But it definitely had an impact on City, I, I think, in the game because they started so slowly. I think they realised that this this can be a really difficult place for us, you know, if if, if uh, we're, we're not right on it. And and Liverpool, we're, we're, you know, 3-0 up inside, what was it, 35 minutes, something like that. Um, so that was the, the, the first game where I would say Liverpool had beaten opponents under Jurgen Klopp previously by this, you know, this heavy metal football but it was the first game where they'd beaten a really, really, really good opponent and 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 just absolutely battered them as well. It was like these are an excellent side, but they just had no answer to it really. Um so it, it was it was just a really moody night, which uh Guardiola, I think it was the first time Guardiola really thought, Oh, I might I might have more of a challenge on here than than maybe he thought six to twelve months earlier. But oh, you lucky people! I mean, from from a from a neutral point of view, um, I don't remember particularly looking forward to the Rafa against Mourinho games because they were they were wars of attrition, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And now you get this with Klopp on one side and Guardiola on the other. You know, you're in you're in for you're in for fireworks. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, people assess sort of what makes Anfield the place it can be, and it's not like that all the time. It really isn't. I mean, it's. Quite a lot of games, the atmosphere is as flat as anywhere else. Just another Premier League ground, which, you, you know, you, you, it, it's it's unremarkable. But on certain occasions, where there's a sense of sense of injustice in the air a little bit, you know, that's why you talk about Liverpool and Chelsea. You know that those occasions were so tense. It was, it was. It was unbearable, almost. You know, they weren't great games, but they were great spectacles because of the te you know the, the tense nature of them. Now, these games between Liverpool and, and City were tense as well, but the football was better. And even though City, you know, over the subsequent years, some you know, they came to Anfield and took a few other beatings as well, but but they 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 more often than not played quite well themselves and played a big role in in the spectacle of the game. It was just on that day, you know, that Liverpool. Uh, maybe add a little bit more than them on the day, but it was you know the the quality of the football between these two teams over the over the years that followed. I think was it's I haven't seen anything better than it. You know between two Premier League teams, I'm not just saying that you know being biased. I mean I I used to love I used to love the United Arsenal games. You know they're fantastic, but um, just in terms of the quality of the the, the technical players that that were on the pitch the. The physical, the intensity, you know, the sort of uncharted hostility. I don't want to say hostility, but this uncharted tension between Klopp and Guardiola, which is never, you always sense that one of them eventually would go over the top for the other, but it never quite happens, which actually added to the, added to that sense of rivalry. Um, and it was great. You know, uh, uh, that period between 2017, 2020, was so many great games. I mean, the second leg at the Etihad, oh my God. I mean, we talk about Anfield, you know, I, I, I should say about Anfield, sorry, in terms of, the, I was trying to define the atmosphere. I always think it's not, it's, it's not about the singing of Anfield, you know, all the songs and all that. That's got nothing to do with the atmosphere. It's the noise of Anfield that, that really gets on top of teams. And when it's angry, when people feel really angry about something, it's a horrible place to be, you know, for the opponents. I always remember... Uh, when Liverpool beat Barcelona 4-0 people try and explain that result and the moment that changed the game was was Luis Suarez deciding that he, he can start taking the mick of some of the players a little bit by agitating in the way he did and the crowd turned on him I've never seen anything like it and that's the trap that so many teams fall into Um you know, if I if I was advising any manager, just don't do anything that's going to annoy people, and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, but the game at the Etihad, I should finish that was was un incredible as well. You know, the the, the double header. Man, I've never seen a team put Liverpool under the grill as much as Man City did in that first half. That they could have they could have been five 0 up. It was an incredible performance from City, one of the best I've ever seen. And Liverpool were really lucky to. I think the decision sort of went their way, and they managed to ride it out. But it was. It was, it was, I was, I remember I was working on the game uh, for the independence. I, I was wincing at what was going on. I was thinking this could end up, you know, six or seven to City, the way it was going. The second game at the Etihad and City are ahead after two minutes. <laughs> after two minutes, maybe a long, long 
uh, 90 for you. But we are in a world here with VAR, sorry, without VAR and with the with the away goals rule. Yeah. Had it been the other way around, do you think that Liverpool would have prevailed? Uh, well, City would have had another penalty, wouldn't they? Uh, I remember there was the, the handball by James Milner, which she, clearly seemed a penalty uh, to me. Um, I mean, one little bit of context that you might enjoy, actually. The, the, the <laughs> when I look back, I, I laugh at. But you know, there was obviously there was this hostility between Liverpool and City off the pitch. It was that that was the amazing thing, really. But I always sense the players they sort of got on. You know, like uh, there was a lot of crossover between players living in the same areas of Cheshire, for example, kids going to the same schools and things like that. But um, it was more off the pitch. The clubs didn't like each other. And I remember uh, that game, all of the Merseyside based reporters were put in a supposed overspill section of the Etihad, uh, which was basically in with the Man City fans right at the back of the ground. And this, this development made its way into the papers the following day. Mm -hmm. And City were not happy about this, shall we say. Um, so it just shows you just sort of the pettiness that goes on between mm. not just the clubs, but the 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 I suppose the uh, the area or the, the cities. But um Liverpool were very lucky in that game. I mean, it, it was that was great. I mean, I I look back at it now and it was one of my favourite games of football, not just because Liverpool won, but just because of the City response. I thought it was remarkable. You know, that they really, they did to Liverpool what Liverpool did to them in the in the, um, in the the first leg. And at half-time, I, I was not confident of Liverpool going through at all. But then I, I also thought that City can't keep this up for as long as they have to get it, they have to, they have to get in, in front over the, you know, the on aggregates. To, to to really you know put the foot to the throat and they weren't able to do that the the luck kept on going Liverpool's way and it's not been a ground that Liverpool have had much luck at over over the years various decisions going against them um, but you know and a reminder as well you know people say about sort of oh you know Manchester City it's you know it's sort of a, a, a new club a new a, a club that has lost sense of what it is but that night the atmosphere there was fantastic you know their their fans really got behind them. It was a, it was an Anfield style response, you know, and made it really, really difficult for Liverpool. And then the moment that changes the tie and effectively decides it is it after 56 minutes of the, the, the Salah goal. Do you think that goal is a wonderful summation of Mohamed Salah as a footballer? Yeah. Yeah. I think you, there is an argument to say that's his biggest goal for Liverpool because it comes in a moment, in his first season, when, yes, he scored a lot of goals already and people are saying, you know, that he is going to be one of the most important players for the next couple of years. Um, I'm not going to say I've seen all this before because I hadn't, because he was doing things and do it. the numbers that he was, he was delivering were off the page and even some of the great players of the past hadn't even got near to what Salah was doing. But you're still doubting, you know, is it, it, will people figure him out? He's got a lot of pace. He does actually miss quite a lot of chances despite, of despite you know, his goal-scoring record. Can you rely on him in a big game? You know, can will he deliver in a moment where Liverpool are under pressure and you come good? And that's exactly what he did. And the, the nature of the goal, you know, it just su it sucked the life out of the atmosphere. And... It was the the delicate way which he he, he there was the, the the pace and the power and then the way he finished the goal, and the way he celebrated the goal. It was just a man to me who looked totally at ease with where he was at and all the attention that was on him, delivering one of the great goal. I think one of the, one of the great Liverpool individual goals almost in a moment where Liverpool really needed it and probably gave him the confidence to if he didn't have it already to know. I can do, I can I can do this on a football pitch when it really really matters and everybody's watching me uh, because he hadn't he hadn't really he's affected some of the big games previously for Liverpool but he totally turned the tide in Liverpool's favour in that game. The thing that really stands out for me is just quick feet. Yeah, right from the start when he's receiving the ball centre field and he moves it on rightwards, which is not the easiest thing to do for a left-footed player receiving yeah. a ball in, 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 in that zone of the field. 
but he moves it on. The, 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 his feet are so quick to get into position, to move it right. And then you get the quick feet at the end. Yeah. When the I, ball I, becomes loose. I think, I mean, you look back at it now and I think, I mean, I'm probably guilty of it as well in sort of saying Salah has arrived at Liverpool as one player, a very fast player who, you know, people just can't live with because of his pace. And even when he leaves, he leaves as a totally other, a different player, somebody who's transformed his game, somebody who now understands his position probably better than anybody else in the world, I would say, at this moment in time, in that role, you know, in the, playing as a left-footed player off the right. Um, but when you look back at that goal, you, it sort of reminds you, his understanding of positional play and his awareness of space, that's what football comes down to, right? You know, space and understanding how to abuse that space. And that's a perfect example of the sort of things that he's delivering now, actually, as well. You, you, I think maybe we actually underestimated him as a footballer, really, for, for probably too long. Um, he's not a polished footballer by any means. You know, he, he doesn't always strike the ball very clean, cleanly, I, I would argue, but... Um, he does it often enough. <laughs> let's face it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a fabulous goal. And as I say, I I just love that sort of, you know, the 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 pause where it, it, the ball slows up as it's going into the net, and you know it's going in, and you know it's going to be a moment that changes the the direction of this game, and you can almost contemplate that as it's going into the net. You know, so it. it you know, he, he can finish in all sorts of different ways, can't he, as well? That's the other thing. You know, he, he's sort of, his trademark has been sort of cutting in on his on his left and, and whipping a shot. But gradually we were seeing all different types of goals from And this is the goal that makes the club, isn't it? It's the goal that makes Klopp's Liverpool. I hadn't realised that this was qualified Liverpool for the first Champions League semi-final in 10 years. Mm. It had been a real struggle for, for a long time at Liverpool. I mean, we, we spoke before about Benitez and Mourinho and those occasions were, you know, between Liverpool and Chelsea were just brilliant. You know, they, they were just sort of game that you get up in the morning and you just know that this game's happening and you're excited about it, you know, because it's not just Champions League. It's just the spectacle around it and knowing that the 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 way it's going to be inside the stadium for that game it's just so exciting. And obviously Liverpool drifted away from the scene. They, they, they had very well uh, documented problems with ownership, you know, falling out the Champions League, a few years out the Champions League, struggling really to, to get back into Europe, not just into the Champions League, but back into Europe. Moments of promise, well, a season of great promise under Brendan Rodgers, which was a remarkable campaign. And one I still remember very fondly, uh, obviously, <laughs> very disappointing way that it ended because it was it was almost you know quite tragic really that that it was Steven Gerrard the player who had delivered so much you know it, that the all of the focus fell on him because it was his mistake. But um, there was no doubt that when Jurgen Klopp came into Liverpool, I think Liverpool is 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 inherently an you know certainly the local fan base is an optimistic fan base. You know, I I, I would say. And people like to think that good times are just around the corner. You know, people really, really do think that their team is going to have a, a positive impact on their day. You know, by comparison, I would argue the Everton fan base is, is sort of pushes against that, really. Mm -hmm. You know, that there is a big difference in the, in sort of the mindset. Liverpool fans think that anything can happen. Well, I, I hate being sort of very sweeping about it, but Evertonians, certainly my friends, sort of think that anything can go wrong. And I can understand why that is. There are deeper yeah. reasons for that, um, which date back to, you know, the unfortunate events of the 80s when Indeed. Everton, yeah. you know, didn't get the chance to go and compete in Europe because of the Heisel disaster. So I, I can understand that. But by the time clock comes in, I, I would say the Liverpool fan base had become quite fatalistic. You know, that they thought that it was... It was, um, you know, he just thought that things were going to go wrong. Really, I, I think Klopp had to had to really confront that and sense that himself. You know, the the you know there the, the wasn't even though they were excited about him coming, there was not much enthusiasm for the team, and they didn't believe in the team very much. 
Um, but he he does manage to turn that round very quickly. Going back, that would go back to a game before Salah's arrival. I think the the biggest game for Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool career was Borussia Dortmund at, at home. You know, I mean, I keep talking about the fan base and the role of the fans, and I think people sometimes people might think, oh, it's it's over, it's over, it's exaggerated, you know. But it it, it does make a difference. I I am. It does make a difference on those big occasions. It can both propel a team and undermine a team. When when the crowd's not having yet, it's a problem. When they are believing, you know, it's it's a very uplifting or difficult place to be. I'd say Anfield. So he was able well, to. If, if I had a time machine, I'd love to go back to that Inter Milan game in the mid sixties. You know, <laughs> the one that the old timers say was the the absolute peak of yeah. the experience. So this is the moment where it's Klopp. And Salah, they create a new Liverpool. And it, it's always seemed to me that Klopp was very, very conscious of the city that he was representing. He just got it. Yeah. Is that true with Salah as well? Does Salah know well, who he's representing? See, I'd, I would... I, I think... Klopp didn't arrive at Liverpool understanding the city's history. I think it's fair to say, and it every place will say it, it's you know it's unique. Every place has got a unique history, but 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 Liverpool's fall as a city, you know, from you mentioned the sixties there, you know, Inter Milan, those games around the time the Beatles were there. Liverpool was a place to be in the sixties. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. The docks and are still thriving. Docks so still on. doing well. Over the next 20 years, you know, it, it was a place that certainly by the start of the 80s was earmarked for for managed decline. Now, the, the governments might say that that never happens, but the evidence is at the end of that decade that it did sure. happen. So there is a huge amount of frustration in Liverpool. I think I think people feel misunderstood still quite a lot. Now, I, I think that Klopp understood the passion of the fans and understood some of the motivations behind the thinking, but I I, it, I, I still don't know whether he really understands all that, you know, not everybody does, you know, understand the, the history. You know, he, he was, he lived in Formby for a long, you know, for his entire time at Liverpool. He wasn't able to go into the city for that reason, you know, so famous, you wouldn't be able to, to move. And so his information about it would have been, given information by the staff around him at Liverpool, I suspect. Now, I think he understands he understands how to how to harness the emotion of the city, whether he understands, implicitly understands the city. I mean, Liverpool is often cast as a as a left wing city. I would say it's a city in opposition. Not a, it's not emphatically left wing. Um I mean you only need to look at uh post ninety seven now I'm not saying that Tony Blair was, you know, the the beacon of of left wing politics, but within 12 months, Liverpool had voted in a Lib Dem council, which existed. Yeah, liberals, there's a strong liberal tradition in Liverpool, isn't there? There is, yeah, there is, and and you know, as re that was in place as recently as 2010, I think. You know, so if Liverpool people don't like something, they will rail against it. You know, and that, as I say, that manifests into the football, the football stadiums on a match day. I, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's it's a city in opposition, and I think where people misrepresent Klopp is he, he, he's, I would say he's more of a social democrat in the in the mm -hmm. in the traditional German sense. So yeah. there's a bit of a misunderstanding, I would say. So to answer the Salah question, right in the book, I mean, I think he he is interested. From what I was told, he was he is interested in politics. He's interested. You know, in American politics, he's he's probably more well versed in American politics and and British politics, maybe than he is in Egyptian politics. You know, because there is, with fairness, not a great deal of politics in Egypt. It's an author authoritarian state, which for for generations has very little opposition. So it's very difficult to form an opinion on alternatives. Really, you know. So coming to England. I'm not saying that you know that, that that England is 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 in a great place politically and hasn't been for a long time, but there is a debate in England which which he is aware of. Um, I think what he he appreciates is 
the, the that love that he gets from the crowd. He 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 likes to feel that love. I think people might say in in these pl players might say use these platitudes. You know, the crowd are great. Blah blah blah. He genuinely does feel that energy, and it does help him play better. I, I know that for a fact. And it, he's mentioned it recently online. I know people might see that as a cryptic tweet, you know, he, but he scored a goal and he, when he scores, he does look up at the cop. He doesn't, he's taking it in. He's trying to, you can see he's trying to absorb that, that sort of feeling that, that he has for him. And it gives him confidence to go out on the pitch and knows that he's got the back in there. Now, again, this is not particularly scientific, but I do believe he's genuine in that. So I think he knows the power of Liverpool, whether he's uh, as, has that political understanding I'm not sure, but then, you know, not a lot of people do have that understanding. Mm. I, I wouldn't blame him. Even some people in Liverpool don't really understand, you know, the the city's sort of, the city's history and the, the struggle that it's had and the club's history. He 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 loves Liverpool for the for the feeling that it gives him. And that feeling that feeling comes from some of the things that we've spoken about, I would say. In writing the book, how much did how much did you have to get into Egypt? Yeah, how much you have to, you know, where he comes from and how that shapes him. I, I would say that that forms half of the book and it defines him. Egypt defines who he is. Um, now that the, the, we can we can talk a lot about this. It depends how far you want to go, but I mean, he 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 um... get that ball and run with it all the way from <laughs> Cairo to Alexandria. Yeah, well, he he comes from a a, a very small town called Nag Nagrig. Now, Nagrig is is. There's lots of towns like Nagrig in Egypt, you know, places which has no town planning, you know, built out of brick and tin, dusty streets, no no amount of wealth there, really. The only way of, of sort of um, working your way upwards, really, is working for the government. Um, you know, you the, the, the fields around Nagrig were... It was a big jasmine supplier, which the government would while Salah was growing up, would sell to foreign countries like France and, and, and Russia. And fortunately, his father was was had involvement in that process. So Salah wasn't one of the poorest people in Nagrig. They, they, they had, I was, it was put to me that he, by Egyptian standards, he he was relatively middle class. You know, he came from a family that, that it, it wasn't the worst struggle compared to some of the other people living in the town. But that being said, he was around that and he he, he understood it. So, um, you know, a, a time of great oppression, you know, under Mubarak, there weren't the political freedoms, there weren't the um, any sign of sort of resistance to the regime was really clamped down on. I was told a story about a nearby village where, um, you know, the, there was there was resistance to a, a basically a landlord who wanted to reclaim some of the land the uh, a hereditary landlord who wanted to claim his land back and he felt resistance and and the the authorities came in like an invading force and really clamped down on on what was going on there so it wasn't a place where you could be expressive in a, in any other way other than football really um so obviously he he works his way up i mean the story of his journey is from nagrig to to cairo are well known and when when he becomes a footballer, you know, people haven't heard of Nagrig. I was told, even in Egypt, people were misspelling it in the reportage, calling it Nagrid. You know, people just never heard of this place. Um, but his rise into into the world, into the, you know, into fame comes at a time when there's a great change in in Egypt. You know, there's the 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 Arab Spring, people hoping for um more the greater possibility of a democracy in Egypt, more 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 language around politics, but the unfortunate reality is Mubarak, who was in charge of Egypt for how long? I'm, I'm, my maths isn't very great. Isn't very good. I think thirty years unopposed. He'd used football really to 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 reinforce his his um his regime. You know, Egypt before Salah. The three, three previous Afcons, they'd won each one. They'd never done that before. No African nations ever done that. And Mubarak, very who could see the way the wind was blowing, used football to to almost reinforce how great he was. Obviously, Mubarak goes. Salah comes into that space almost that that fame space, 
at a time when people are now becoming a bit more cynical, you know, about football, really, because they realised that they were fooled into this craze, which disguised a lot of the problems in Egypt. So Salah equally doesn't have, you know, he, he never played for Al Ahly or Zamalek, the two big clubs mm -hmm. in Egypt. So he doesn't have a massive support base, but for a period he becomes a player that everybody can love because he... Yeah, because he, there's no rejection there, isn't it? Exactly. It's not like... Exactly, exactly. So he um, he obviously scores the goal that qualifies Egypt for the first World Cup since uh, 1990. So 28 years is an absolute megastar in Egypt. Some, suddenly he's the most you know, famous Egyptian ever. This is in the uh, Egyptian, sorry, not the most famous Egyptian ever. He's the most famous Egyptian footballer ever. But very quickly, obviously the World Cup comes around. He's suddenly beginning to realise, you know, that things aren't as they should be, you know, within the country's FA. There are problems over um, um, media rights and, and some of the contracts that he signs conflicting with the Egyptian FA. This all plays out in public. And suddenly people are starting to ask the question, you know, why is he, why is he creating this distraction? Why is he asking for more? You know, to, and in Salah's head, he, he thinks that, you know, he's trying to, He's trying to bring change by bringing a more professionalized environment to the to the country that he wants to lead, and he so the, this this new conversation starts about him then. And twenty eighteen, you know, and that people never really picked up on it in the UK really, but he, he obviously has an amazing season with Liverpool. It ends sourly because he obviously gets injured in the Champions League final, famously goes to the World Cup. It's a really bad World Cup for Egypt, and. Um, very quickly, you know, I'd say some people turn against him, you know, in, in Egypt, and there's more of a debate around him now. You know, it's not, it's not. He he is he is loved by the majority, but people are just a bit more cynical about his his motivations and 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 don't feel that connection that they may have had with somebody like uh, Mohammed Abu Trika, who was the the, the mm -hmm. hero of before. Of course, Salah is aware of 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 the problems that Abu Trika has faced because he now lives in exile, having spoken politically during the Arab Spring and afterwards. Yeah. So Salah realises the limitation to the things that he can say and do. He thinks that just by playing football can can inspire change. Now, I'll just finish on this point. Where, where he might, where you can support him on that view is, you know, at the end of that season at Liverpool, there was a, a survey done and anti-Muslim sentiment in Merseyside dropped dramatically and he done nothing. He he done nothing. He never said anything. He just played football and scored mm -hmm. a load of goals for a team that lots of people like. So I can understand that sort of chain yeah. of thought. But there are events sometimes where you probably feel like you have to intervene. But but he 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 finds it hard to is he's treading a very thin line because every time he makes a donation to Egypt or something in Egypt, he's highlighting the things that are wrong in Egypt, which creates a problem for him potentially. How is all of this? going to influence what he does next. <laughs> well, it will, it will. I think it will. I mean, I think there's an assumption, certainly in the West, that Saudi Arabia, oh, he'd love to go to Saudi Arabia. Now, yes, he would get paid more money in Saudi Arabia, but there are a couple of things to consider here. He loves he loves playing in the UK. He loves playing, he loves living where he lives. His kids can go to school without any, any um, yeah. sort of interest in them. He lives a very private life can focus totally on his football. Now, if he goes back to the region where he is, he is obviously sort of, the, culturally, there will be more of a focus on him. He would, I think he would find it hard. And I think he knows that. I, I don't think there's that determination as as a, mo a famous Muslim footballer to go, go back at this stage in his life when his family is settled, when he still feels like he's... Um, you know, he still feels like he's at the top of his game as well. I, I, I get the feeling that if he went to Saudi Arabia, for example, he would get frustrated by a country that is still developing its structures for in terms of football. Um, and then there's the other thing is that you know Saudi Arabia and Egypt don't have the best relations as well. <laughs> you know, e Egypt as a country sort of feels like it's had its mantle taken by Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You know, with its new money. You know, Egypt, the cradle of civilization. People are very proud of that. They, pe Egyptians would be interested because you'd be coming back to the region. But then equally, they might be saying, well, why is he not coming back to Egypt? Why mm -hmm. is why is the authorities in Egypt not allowing him to go to Saudi Arabia? Is that another reflection of where we are as a people? You know, could, could, should we be asking more of ourselves, of our 
leaders. So there's all these complexities that I'm not quite certain people are, are fully aware of. The bottom line is, you know, the, the, I've said this elsewhere, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but, you know, there's a scene in, in a Alan Partridge where he's trying to bribe Monty Don to advertise a garden trowel. And the offer keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And Partridge ends up offering him 20 million pounds. And, Par and Monty Don's like, what, 20 million? Of course, Alan, of course I'll do that. You know, eventually if the offer goes so big, it might be quite difficult to say no. But I, I do think that um, I do think that at this moment in his life where he can, he, he, he should be aware of the fact that Saudi Arabia are obviously probably going to get the World Cup in 2034. Their interest in football is not going to go away. And Rami Abbas's agent said that Mohamed Salah can play football at the highest level till he's 40. So there could be, he, might, he might be able to go there two contracts along the line. I don't think their interest in him is going to go away. You've uh, you brought it back to the solid round of Alan Partridge, <laughs> but I'm, I get the impression that you've enjoyed this. It's been a a journey of discovery for you. Yes, to yes, see yeah. the world from inside, to try and see the world from inside the head of of Mohamed Salah. Definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I, I've I I've written this from a position of interest. You know, it's like yeah. I, like a lot of people he's probably quite a hard person to love because we, we don't know much about him. And some of the reasons why we don't know much about him are, are nestled in the conversation that we've just, just had. Yeah. So I'm just fascinated by him, his rise. I'm not sure whether uh, uh, people keep saying, you know, uh, he, he, he thinks that his story can be an inspiration for other Egyptian footballers, but I'm, I, I'm, he might just be a one-off, you know, it, Given some, you know, given what he's achieved, I'm not sure that other other Egyptians might follow him. I, I just think he's an extraordinary footballer who has a and a very intense mentality, which is unlike you know a lot of people. And I, I was just keen to sort of try and understand that, and 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 most most importantly, understand the forces around him of why he's mm. this sort of quite secretive, cryptic character. Who very very rarely gives little away about himself. Um, so from that perspective, I found it it really really interesting. And um, you know, I, the the thing is, he he doesn't have a he doesn't have a, a an open presence in the book. He, he, he I didn't interview him, and I, I decided not to pursue it aggressively because I, I felt well, he's not going to tell me. He's not going to tell me. Um, something that he hasn't told somebody else. I don't think he ever will go on the record about the, the true challenges of his life, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. It'll only be a, a slanted version, which might be quite safe. And I understand why that is because of, and it goes back to Egypt, you know, it goes back to, he has to play a very careful game. So, so yeah, uh, that, that was the side of it that I really enjoyed. And then, I mean, it, you know, a lot of the book is about his time at Liverpool and his relationships with people there and how, how far the club would go to appease him as well and, and keep him happy. So hopefully there's enough in each chapter to keep people reading. That's what I always think. Do you come to the end of the process of writing his book on Mo Salah thinking that you know him or do now, do you, do you have still have more questions and answers, but only now on a deeper level? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I know, I know his motivations more. I feel like I know the forces around him more, but there is that sense of mystery still. And I, I, I discussed, I discussed that with a couple of people. Like, you know, if I don't get to that, is that a problem? You know, is this does that mean that it's not a definitive version of him? But I, I, I don't think there ever will be a definitive version mm. of who Mohammed Salah is. And I actually don't think there's a bit of harm in allowing people to form their own judgments as well in in, in a book sometimes about about that person and that individual. I just hope it shines a light, a light on him a bit more and makes people understand his story a bit better because I, I think people just see his story quite narrowly, really. You know, the, when he signed for Liverpool especially, lots of people, including myself, made this this journey from Nagrig to Cairo and Cairo to Nagrig and tried to put themselves in the position of Mohamed Salah. But I, I realised, you know, I, I was sort of wasting my time a little bit because... I'm, you know, at the time in, in my mid thirties, you know, he was a young boy when he was doing this. And I think people sort of box him in that, that's Mohamed Salah, cute story. When yeah. the reality is, you know, it was quite 
She had a lot to contend with in, in this, at this time, in this moment of history, you know, momentous history in the Middle East, which is on the news, Middle East and North Africa, which is on the news all the time. It's impossible for that not to affect Mohammed Salah. Yes. Yeah, we're all products of our times. Mm -hmm. And his time has been has been interesting and, and may may yet get become more interesting in the future. I think so. I think so. I think, you know, I think people sort of view lots of footballers now as when they get over the age of 30, you know, they're, oh, they're, they're on the wane. Um, there's a conversation in Liverpool at the moment. Did he give him a new contract? How far did he go? I do think he'll he'll be around for a few years later and there'll still be interest in him. Um, I think I can understand why the conversation happened because last season... He had a bad injury. I was inside the stadium in in uh, Abidjan in, in Cote d'Ivoire when this happened and pulled up with his hamstring and I thought, oh, this is a big moment. You know, in his career, in Liverpool's season, in his Liverpool future, this could shape a lot of things. And he did not finish the season well. Obviously, big, big row with Jürgen Klopp laid out in the full glare of the public. Um, so people start thinking, you know, is 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 this near the end? But... He's been spectacularly good again this season. I mean, uh, some of his best football, I would say, clever play, very, mm. as I say, very clever positional play, dragging people, young players who are very highly rated into places that they just don't want to be and much more creative player than he was in, in, in the past. So he, for me, I, I think, providing he doesn't get any serious injuries, can play at the top of his game for much longer because he's adapted his game. You know, he's a great lesson for young players who think that, you know that they, they can't change, or they, they they have to be pigeonholed as being one certain thing. He he's really evolved as a footballer, and I think would be an asset to any of the big teams in the world, providing they play. You know, with with with, with a three up top. That being said, you know I think he, he excellent centre forwards as well at times. Position he's played well for Liverpool. So yeah, I think the big the big thing for him coming up is 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 Egypt as well. You know. The conversation about him will change if he wins an AFCON, which is something he hasn't done, which he's judged against the the previous, mm. you know, the previous uh, the previous greats who represented the country before him. Equally, I also think that he he sees, well, I know that he sees the last sort of three or four years as a major disappointment at Liverpool in terms of the trophies that he's won. Uh, I don't think he can overstate that. I think a lot of a lot of Liverpool fans have enjoyed the journeys to the Champions League and various near misses they've had in the, in the Premier League because of the stories that sort of tra are traded off off those those experiences and runs to those games. But Salah has not been a happy bunny because he wants to win. Um, he That drives him on. Um, I think the way Liverpool started the season and the, the role that he's played in it, it's going to say... I, I get the feeling he, he, he would love to stay, really. And I think it would be in the club's interest and his interest to keep that relationship for at least another couple of years. It's whether whether the club and his representative, Rami Abbas, can sort of can reach that compromise. I think on the outside, I think there's a there's a view that Abbas is like a real tough sort of negotiator who won't won't compromise. The truth is, I think the club it's the he will compromise. I think it's the club that have got to be a bit more open minded about this and less fearful of injuries. And and age, I think he's a special case, Salah. Um, difficult one for them, but you know that the, uh, which other player in world football has scored twenty plus goals seven seasons on the run? Very difficult player to replace. And where does that leave him for you? In for you and others in the Liverpool fan base, where does that leave him in the pantheon? Well, very difficult. Well, I think he's in the top five or six. Really, I mean. The conversation usually the top two it's either Kenya Dalglish, Stephen Gerrard. Um, they're two people who are very difficult to dislodge. But let's say if Salah stays, Liverpool do win another title and win another Champions League. I think he's going to be pretty close to that. That's not beyond the realms of possibility. I I, I think it could happen. Um, he'd be very he'd be in the conversation with those two players. I think I think it will be it will boil down to the. Success obviously, Gerard's a different matter because he didn't win the Premier League. But obviously, in terms of his longevity, and I know he did move on in the end. But um, I think if Salah does win a bit more, I think he'll be much closer to him in terms of the goals. I mean, the, the thing that I love about his story is I always thought that sort of 
Liverpool, Ian Rush would would never be touched, you know, as as a as a the club's top goal scorer, and he probably won't be if we're being honest. So, sorry, Mohamed Salah would have to stay there for another couple of years to get, even get close to that. But I think um, he's got into the side in, involved in that conversation. You know, he's not far off. By the end of the season, I think he he needs another twenty goals to get into the top three top scorers. I mean, that's incredible for a player in his. I know football's changed and f wingers get much closer to goal than arguably they ever did, but it, it's an incredible achievement, that I, I, I would say, uh, to, to get above a lot of the players that who are out-and-out -out goal scorers, players who are adored by Liverpool fans. So for me, you know, he is right up there. He's one of the... He, he's, he was a transformational signing for Liverpool, made everything seem possible. Um and it's just been relentless for a long period of time to the point where I just think people, a, a lot of people watching him sort of underestimate him in, in some ways. You know, It's easier to take him for granted. Yeah, they take him for granted. I, I think that one thing I've learned watching Liverpool and covering Liverpool over a long period of time, it's very easy to let greatness go. It's much harder to find it mm. again. And if they let him go now with the season that he's having... It's a massive risk, I, I would say. Traditionally, on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, we have a look at the, uh, the, the the musical charts from the time. But I have to say, after subjecting myself to the top twenty, I can't think of anything interesting to say about it apart from it's not aimed at me. So uh, I think we I think we can we can, we can safely skip that, Simon. Just to end, and thank you very much for for your time and insight. Remind everyone of the name of the book, where they can get it, and I think you've made a very emphatic case for why that th this is such an interesting story. Thanks. So it's called Chasing Salah. So that the title gets at the fact that he's almost untouchable. You can't quite get yeah. close enough to him, you know. Um, and it's available everywhere at the moment. Um, I'd rather not say the obvious place where you can get it uh, online, yeah, but just go to your local bookshop. It, it probably will be there, uh, I, I would say. Um, yeah, and it, it came out last week. So, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love everybody to read it, obviously. But... Um, I just think his his story is unique in world football. I think now he he doesn't like being defined as as a Muslim footballer. He he wants to be defined as a footballer. He think that he thinks that that it that that changes perceptions more than being identified as as a, in a religious sense. If that makes sense, and I understand that. So he is you know what he's achieved is spectacular and. Um, it is a story that I, I felt for a long time is worthy of more examination. So hopefully, hopefully people will will see that when they read it. The heroes of yesteryear were the likes of Roger Hunt, quite you know almost almost local lads. Today in the globalized era, we have a Liverpool hero from a small town in Egypt. Read all about it in Chasing Salah by Simon Hughes. Strongly recommended. And Simon, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Tim.